'Twas the night before Christmas, when all through the house not a creature was stirring, not even a ma- What? What do you mean I'm breaking the law? I'm getting ready for Christmas. What do you mean they've banned it? No, no, no. When did this happen? 1644? Oh, I was on my tea break then. Oh, I see, the year 1644. Well, whose idea was that? Oliver Cromwell's? <laughs> no, it wasn't. Every December at the office Christmas party, you can guarantee that Colin from finance will attempt to impress his colleagues with his wider knowledge of things beyond the world of spreadsheets and flowcharts by donning his Santa hat and informing them sagely that Oliver Cromwell once banned Christmas and that, as a result, it is actually illegal to eat mince pies on Christmas Day. Now, in fairness to Colin, Christmas, or at least the celebrations associated with it, were made illegal during Oliver Cromwell's time, although he himself, Oliver, not Colin, was not personally responsible for the ban. To find out how this came to pass, we must make our way down the chimney of time to arrive in not-so-merry old England in the 1600s. In the first half of the 17th century, Christmas was an extended celebration. Christmas Day itself was a holy day, but it marked the beginning of the 12 days of Christmas that would extend the festivities into January, culminating with Twelfth Night. Traditionally, it was a period when people ate, drank and generally parted to excess. There was singing and dancing, there were games and gambling, not to mention disgracefully raunchy behaviour and significant immorality. In short, people as a whole abandoned their usual inhibitions and enjoyed a glorious period of misrule. A splendid time was guaranteed for all. Except, that is, for the ever-growing number of God-fearing Puritans, who, from the late 16th century, had been looking askance at the ungodly behaviour that they witnessed each festive period. They also viewed Christmas, or Christ's Mass, as a relic of Roman Catholicism. England, after all, was now a Protestant country, and the Puritans were intent on stamping out all relics of the old faith, and they began setting their sights on Christmas. Show us where in the Bible it says that Christ was born on the 25th of December, and which passage it is that instructs us to celebrate that day as his nativity, they demanded of their partying neighbours, although those neighbours couldn't actually hear them over the raucous din of the drunken singing and immoral merrymaking, emanating from their houses. As long as Charles I reigned, the rituals and festivities associated with the season were safe. But in the early 1640s, power began to shift from the king to parliament, and in January 1642, just before the onset of the Civil War, the king gave assent to legislation passed by parliament that made the last Wednesday of each month a solemn day of fasting and repentance. For two years, Christmas continued as usual. But in 1644, the 25th of December was due to fall on a Wednesday, and Parliament ordered that the monthly day of abstinence was to be strictly adhered to, and Christmas Day was to be treated as a day of penance and reflection. The shops, they decreed, were to remain open, and people were to go about their hard-working, puritanical pursuits, minus a lunch break, of course. There was to be no misrule this Yule. Given that England was in the middle of a civil war and the instruction was not issued until a few days before Christmas, it is debatable whether that many people actually adhered to the ordinance. Then, in January 1645, the Westminster Assembly of Divines, a group of religious ministers appointed by Parliament to find a replacement for the Book of Common Prayer, came up with a directory for public worship of God throughout the three kingdoms of England, Scotland and Ireland, together with an ordinance of Parliament for the taking away of the Book of Common Prayer and the establishing and observing of this present directory through the Kingdom of England and the Dominion of Wales. Now, to be honest, that title was a bit of a mouthful. Trust me, it's taken me five hours to record it. And so it soon became commonly known as the Directory of Public Worship. It did what it said on the cover and laid down how and when people were to worship. 
Two years later, in June 1647, the Westminster Assembly passed an ordinance confirming that the feasts of Christmas, Easter and Whitsun had been officially abolished. However, by way of compensation for apprentices, servants and other workers, the second Tuesday of each month was declared a secular holiday. Although, to be honest, since the Puritans weren't renowned for their love of fun and frivolity, it didn't really compensate for the loss of the good old days when they could look forward to a 12-day binge over Christmas. Many people began looking back on the golden age when they could eat, drink and indulge in all sorts of shenanigans to their heart's content. In response to the loss of the feast, an anonymous pamphleteer published the ballad The World Turned Upside Down, sung to the tune of When the King Enjoys His Own Again. No, me neither, so I shall spare you the ordeal of hearing me sing it, lest my channel gets banned this Christmas, and instead I shall recite a selection of the verses for you, the first of which went, Listen to me, and you shall hear, news hath not been this thousand year, since Herod, Caesar, and many more, you never heard the like before. Holy days are despised, new fashions are devised, old Christmas is kicked out of town. Yet let's be content, and the times lament, you see the world turned upside down. Another verse went, Command is given we must obey, and quite forget old Christmas Day. Till a thousand men, or a town regain, we will give thanks and praise amain. The wine pot shall clink, we will feast and drink, and then strange motions will abound. Yet let's be content, and the times lament, you see the world turned upside down. The final verse made reference to the Battle of Naseby on the 14th of June 1645, at which Charles I and the Royalist forces were soundly defeated by the Parliamentarians, and thus all hope of a return to the olden times was lost. It lamented, To conclude, I'll tell you news that's right, Christmas was killed at Naseby fight, Charity was slain at that same time, Jack tell Troth too, a friend of mine. Likewise then did die, rust beef and shred pie, pig, goose and capon, no quarter found. Yet let's be content, and the times lament, you see the world turned upside down. Now, I'll grant you, it's not as catchy as either, so here it is Merry Christmas, or I wish it could be Christmas every day, but it certainly captured the mood of the public, and, as Christmas 1647 approached, The members of Parliament were determined that this year people would obey the ban, and they sent out orders that mayors across the country were to enforce it as ruthlessly as was necessary, and they were to make sure that shopkeepers stayed open on the 25th of December. The stage was set for confrontation. On the day itself, the Lord Mayor of Canterbury, a staunch Puritan by the name of William Bridge, headed out onto the streets with a band of constables to ensure that the citizens were abiding by the law and that the shops were open and trading. Finding many of them shuttered, Bridge remonstrated with one shopkeeper and demanded that he lower his shutters. The shopkeeper told Bridge where he could stick his ordinance, and the Lord Mayor responded by diplomatically punching the man in the face. Within moments, an ugly scene had ensued as an angry crowd assembled took hold of the Lord Mayor and pitched him headlong into the gutter. Getting up, Bridge ordered his constables to charge the crowd, and the crowd responded with jeers, fists and any missiles that came to hand. Things were rapidly getting out of control, and according to a contemporary account, the authorities slunk away to save their heads. And then it got worse. The revolting rabble decided to play a game of football. Back then, football, or soccer for my American viewers, was a little different to what it is today. For a start, we tend to riot after rather than before the game. It was generally played with an inflated bladder, which participants kicked, picked up and threw to each other as they tried to get it from one side of the city or town to the other whilst their opponents tried to wrest the bladder from them and carry, kick and throw it in the opposite direction. It was generally a festival sport played on holidays such as May Day, Easter and, of course, Christmas. The players, and anyone could participate whether they actually wanted to or not, tended to get well and truly tanked up before the match, so inevitably 
violence, injury and damage to property were commonplace. And that's what happened in Canterbury that Christmas day. With the match over, the citizens returned to the fray and the rioting continued throughout the next day, the rampaging mobs swollen by gangs from outlying villages who came in to join in the fun. The city magistrates tried to pacify the rebels, but to no avail, and the unrest continued until the mob's fury was spent, or, to be more precise, when they had sobered up, and things finally began to calm down. With order restored, the magistrates agreed to the demand that the instigators of the unrest should not be prosecuted. But Lord Mayor Bridges' pride had been injured, and he appealed to Parliament, who at once sent 3,000 soldiers to seize the town. The justices, who had opted not to prosecute the ringleaders, found themselves imprisoned at Leeds Castle, and a special commission was set up to apportion blame. However, the jury returned a verdict of ignoramus, a cautious and pragmatic decision that was neither a guilty nor a not guilty verdict. Christmas 1647 thereafter was remembered as the year of the Plum Pudding Riots in Canterbury. Following the execution of Charles I on Tuesday the 30th of January 1649, Parliament's authority was secured and over the next few years, the members began tightening their grip on the country, especially with regard to the banning of Christmas. In 1652, further legislation was passed which decreed that it had been resolved by the Parliament that no observation shall be had of the five and twentieth day of December, commonly called Christmas Day, nor any solemnity used or exercised in churches upon the day in respect thereof. A year later, on the 16th of December, 1653, Cromwell was made Lord Protector for life, and one of his key aims became the spiritual and moral reform of the nation. In 1656, the Second Parliament of the Protectorate attempted to bring in legislation that introduced strict penalties for those who celebrated Christmas at home, although no bill was in fact actually passed. At the same time, the members quietly dropped the unpopular monthly day of Wednesday fasting. A measure of the success of the banning of Christmas can be gleaned from the fact that when Parliament met on Christmas Day 1656, some of the members were decidedly grumpy because they had been kept awake all night by their neighbours' preparations for this foolish day's solemnity. They were also incensed by the fact that, as they walked in on the 25th, not one of the shops was open in London and not a creature was stirring, not even a mouse. Evidently, prohibition wasn't working, so the next year they were even more determined to suppress Christmas once and for all. One person who fell foul of this latest clampdown was the diarist John Evelyn, whose diary entry for the 25th of December that year sheds a disturbing light on the lengths to which the authorities went to suppress the celebration of the festival. 25th of December, 1657. I went to London with my wife to celebrate Christmas Day, Mr. Gunning preaching in Exeter Chapel. Sermon ended, as he was giving us the Holy Sacrament, the chapel was surrounded with soldiers, and all the communicants and assembly surprised and kept prisoners by them, some in the house, others carried away. It fell to my share to be confined to a room in the house, where yet I was permitted to dine with the master of it, the Countess of Dorset, Lady Hatton, and some others of quality who invited me. In the afternoon came Colonel Wally, Gough, and others from Whitehall to examine us one by one. Some they committed to the marshal, some to prison. When I came before them, they took my name and abode, examined me why, contrary to the ordinance made, that none should any longer observe the superstitious time of the nativity, so esteemed by them, I durst offend, and particularly be at common prayer, which they told me was but the mass in English, and particularly pray for Charles Stuart, for which we had no scripture. I told them we did not pray for Charles Stuart, but for all Christian kings, princes, and governors. They replied, in so doing, we prayed for the king of Spain, too, who was their enemy, and a papist, with other frivolous and ensnaring questions, and much threatening, and finding no colour to detain me, they dismissed me with much pity of my ignorance. These were men of high flight, and above ordinances, and spoke spiteful things of our Lord's nativity. 
As we went up to receive the sacrament, the miscreants held their muskets against us, as if they would have shot us at the altar, but yet suffering us to finish the office of communion, as perhaps not having instructions what to do, in case they found us in that action. So I got home late the next day. Blessed be God. By the time of Oliver Cromwell's death on the 3rd of September, 1658, the country was growing tired of the puritanical way of life that Parliament had imposed on them, and the reign of Charles I was being looked fondly back on as a golden age. In 1660, Charles II returned from exile, and the restoration of the monarchy got underway. The Directory of Public Worship, along with all the legislation the previous parliaments had passed to abolish holy days and their excesses, were declared null and void, and the twelve days of Christmas were restored. Geese could lay, swans could swim, maids could milk, ladies could dance, lords could leap, pipers could pipe, and drummers could drum. And, before you go all pedantic on me, yes, I know that particular carol dates from the 18th century, but nobody's dead tell my true love that. And anyway, hey, it's Christmas, Frosty the Puritan. So, did Oliver Cromwell, as Colin from Finance would have us believe, actually ban Christmas and make eating mince pies illegal? In short, he did, and he didn't. Although he was present in Parliament during the passing of the 1644 ban, he was more concerned with defeating the Royalists than with waging war on Christmas, and he wasn't even present when the main ban was imposed in 1647. However, since the mid-1650s clampdowns happened during his protectorate, it could be argued that he was partly responsible for those, and thereafter his name would become indelibly linked with the ban. So we can give Colin a faint nod of polite acknowledgement for that one. As far as the banning of mince pies goes, however, none of the legislation made any mention about the clamping down on the chomping down of mince pies. And let's just establish that mince pies in those days were not the sugary treats we enjoy today. They were, in fact, meat pies, and their ingredients usually consisted of ox tongue and suet with a crusty topping. Technically, it could be argued that they were banned in 1644, but only because Christmas Day fell on a legally mandated day of fasting, but mince pies were certainly not singled out specifically. Aside from that, the only contemporary references to mince pies being outlawed are found in satirical pamphlets of the age, such as the water poet John Taylor's Christmas In and Out, published in 1652, which has the character of Christmas lamenting that There were lately some over-curious, hot, zealous brethren who with a superbian predominance did do what they could to keep Christmas Day out of England. They did, in diverse places, preach me for dead in funeral sermons, and laboured tooth and nail to bury me alive in the grave of oblivion. They were of opinions that from the 24th of December at night till the 7th of January following, that plum pottage was mere popery, that a collar of brawn was an abomination, that roast beef was anti-Christian, that mince pies were relics of the whore of Babylon, and a goose, a turkey, or a capon were marks of the beast. But such texts were satire, intended to portray Puritans as killjoys, and were certainly not accurate records of the times. Although I have to say that calling a brand of mince pies relics of the whore of Babylon would certainly make that brand a Christmas bestseller. But the fact remains that Cromwell never did make mince pies illegal. However, some modern newspapers are not exactly renowned for letting the facts stand in the way of a good story and the fallacy that Cromwell made eating mince pies illegal still gets trotted out every year. The Daily Mail, for example, on the 4th of February 2010, informed its readers that it is illegal to eat mince pies anywhere in England on Christmas Day. Oliver Cromwell considered pies a forbidden pagan pleasure, and on December the 22nd, 1657, his Puritan council banned the consumption of mince pies on Christmas Day. Social media is not far behind in propagating the myth. Hashtag Fun Fact Friday on Facebook informs people that it is technically illegal to eat mince pies on Christmas Day in England. In the 17th century, Oliver Cromwell banned Christmas pudding, mince pies and anything to do with gluttony, 
the law has never been rescinded. In fact, the law has never been rescinded because it never actually existed. And even if it did, all the laws to do with Christmas that had been passed during the Commonwealth were rescinded following the restoration of the monarchy in 1660. So the oft-trotted out canard that it is still illegal to eat mince pies on Christmas Day is, with the greatest of respect to Colin from finance, simply not true. Anyway, where was I? "'Twas the night before Christmas, when all through the house "'not a creature was stirring, not even a mouse. "'The stockings were hung by the chimney with care. "'Merry Christmas, everybody!' "'Please note, Colin from Finance is a fictional character "'dreamt up by Richard Jones for the purpose of this video "'and is not in any way related to an actual Colin "'working in a finance department.' Richard Jones would like to apologise sincerely to any Colin from finance who might be enjoying the annual Christmas party for any inconvenience or distress the use of his name might cause. Unless, of course, you are about to tell your colleagues that they are breaking the law by eating mince pies at Christmas. In which case, no, no, no. Now, where's my guitar? <laughs>